This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. Hi everybody, I'm Dr. David Granite, and welcome to Health Matters. In the beginning of 2012, the first two months, two million Americans traveled abroad. You may be one of them. You may have plans to travel abroad coming up. What about your health while you're outside the country? What can happen to you? How can you prevent a problem? What do you have to know? And what happens when you get home if you get sick? It's a lot of questions, but we have somebody who has all the answers. Professor. Joseph Vinitz from UCSD Medical Center, welcome. Thank you very much. Dr. Vinitz is a specialist in parasitology, infectious diseases, tropical medicine, the whole gamut. So we're really glad to have you here. At some point, a lot of people get on a plane or get in a car and they leave the United States. When they're getting ready to go outside the United States, how do they know if they need to know anything? Well, I mean, there's some countries um, on Earth that are very similar to the sanitation and other sort of standard of living we have in the U.S. So if you're going to Japan, if you're going to almost anywhere in Western Europe, uh, these are places you really don't have to worry too much about. In fact, most of China these days, where tourists go to, also have uh, fairly high standards of sanitation and, and general safety. But there are certain places in the world, um, in much of Asia, Southeast Asia, away from large cities, certain countries, uh, Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, uh, the islands, the Philippines, um, Russia, much of Russia is less developed, uh, much of Central Europe is less developed, certainly in the rural areas, um, and certainly South America. Um, much of South America, which is different between the eastern part in Brazil or Chile and Argentina in the south and the west, is different than Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru up in the north, which is still different than Central America. Huh. And so for places that are more like the United States in terms of standards of living, you don't worry so much about any special precautions for travel. But um, for many um, places, uh, exotic places, uh, places where uh, we call the developing world, that's the places that often need special uh, emphasis on travelers' safety. While you were listing off some of those places, it occurred to me that all of them want to get our business now. And, and they're reaching out to try and make them seem less exotic, but opening their doors to get people to travel there. They want us to come and show up and spend money there. And, and I know many more people are going to those places than used to go. So if I'm going to a country and I'm not sure about it, and I think I need to know a little bit about it, where can I go to get the information to see if this is a country where there may be stuff that I have to do? So the most authoritative site is really the CDC website. There's something online and free from the CDC called the Yellow Book, which is at cdc.gov. And it has general um, uh, issues about infectious diseases and some other local uh, health issues, generally infectious and diseases. And we should tell people that the CDC is the Centers for Disease Control and it's funded by our tax dollars. That's right. And they keep this up, they keep the yellow book updated every year. It's considered authoritative. It has some limitations because it doesn't go to, it doesn't have a very fine resolution. So you don't know if I go to this city and this camping area and this hotel, what, what's going to happen? Sure. Uh, I came across when I was preparing to talk to you because I, 
I wanted to know a little bit about this, um, that the uh, United States government also has the State Department website for travel.state.gov that gives you countries where there's concern or issues that you have to be aware of. That's very important because uh, the State Department puts out travel advisories in case of political or social instability, um, but the, the State Department also provides um, uh, aid to uh, Americans in need. And so whether you get your passport stolen or you get very sick and don't know where to go, uh, the local embassies and consulates in the major cities in almost all countries around the world, except for where we don't have diplomatic relations, are excellent sources of referral because you're, you're an American in need. So um, that was one of the questions I had for you. So if I'm in some country that I, I don't know anybody, I, I can't pick up the phone and call my friend and say, who should I go to? I don't know what the hospitals are like. Uh, as an American, I can call the consulate. That's correct. And they, and they will help navigate for me, or? They will, in fact, they'll make local referrals to qualified um, health institutions, whether it's a hospital or a physician. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's a general and, and, and generally reliable. There are some private organizations that will also provide such information for a fee. Well, that's great. Now, I have health insurance, and, and I'm getting ready to travel across to other parts of the world, do I have to worry that if I get sick, I'm going to pay for the bill or my insurance will cover it? Is that something that somebody traveling should check before they leave the United States? I think you need to, I think each traveler has to check it before they leave. Um, often you can be reimbursed, but there's um, many of the private health insurance plans uh, do not uh, include foreign travel. However, there's something called the International SOS, which is for a very nominal fee will provide international health insurance. Uh, which is kind of a supplement including medical evacuation insurance. Um, uh, many, uh, for, uh, many health and, uh, provider uh, insurances, whether HMO or, or a, a PPO or other insurance mechanisms will provide reimbursement, but you're going to have to pay for it up front. But you'll be, if you go to Thailand, for example, I once went to Thailand, I had a conjunctivitis, and, I, and it was terrible. My wife made me go, <laughs> and it cost me $4.00 to see the doctor and, uh, and two dollars for the medicine uh, uh, for a, a one hour evaluation <laughs> with a with a professional first rate evaluation so yeah. you'd be surprised to see how cheap these things are some places well uh, that's important to know now um, w when you're getting ready to go if you have uh, a problem you want to take your medicines with you can you take your medicines to other countries and if you run out or if you have a problem, can you trust the medicines you get in the countries? There are two, uh, two aspects of that question. One, if you're going to take general medicines abroad, um, you're supposed to bring your prescription with you. Um, that's a little bit difficult because you handed that into the pharmacy. Yes. But if it's in, a, uh, if it's in the originally packaged containers, uh, that's generally fine. Narcotics, you, uh, if it's Vicodin or some other pain pills, or other narcotic medications, you want to make sure it's very clearly labeled with your name on it because those are subject to inspection. Illicit drugs is another story, um, which uh, that's obviously going to get you in a lot of trouble. Obviously. Um, as far as drugs in another country, um, it depends on where you go. There's a lot of counterfeit medications. Uh, if you're staying at a high, uh, um, a very, uh, uh, you know, say a five-star resort, in most countries, they'll actually have a connection to a pharmacy that might even provide uh, delivery of a medication to replace what you have on site, even without a prescription huh. for international travelers. Uh, different countries have, have different policies on whether you need a prescription for medication or not. Um, antibiotic prescriptions, for example, in Peru are now required, whereas three years ago you didn't need a prescription for antibiotics. And you can go into pharmacies in some countries and you may not recognize the names of some of the drugs and you may find things on the shelves that you would never see in the United States. That's right. And so there's certain approvals for different drugs that are different. There's certain drugs that are equivalent. Um, one of the services that we may talk about um, uh, that we provide at UCSD is, is internet communications. And so if there's any questions about replacing drugs or equivalent drugs, we, we can provide this, that sort of information through, through email, which is inevitably available in almost uh, anywhere that people go to. Yeah, in, in this day and age. Now, there are some basic precautions that people can take. Um, washing their hands. <laughs> uh, making sure food is cooked. What are the things that you suggest to people when they come see you as part of the travel-related services that they can get through UCSD? What do you recommend that just to 
you know, general precautions to make sure nothing happens to them. So if somebody, let's say, wants to go on a three-week trip to Africa, and they want to climb Mount Kilimanjaro and then go on a safari in Kenya and then maybe take a jaunt to South Africa to go to the Kruger National Park. Sounds great to so me. So this is common. I mean, we okay. see you know, a common uh, reason to seek travel medicine advice. So somebody comes, makes an appointment with you to talk to you and say, oh, man, I'm going to be gone for a while and this, I'm afraid I, something could go wrong. And they actually, you examine them, you check them to make sure there's nothing obvious and you, then you sit down with them and... And so we go through, there's a very systematic uh, way of assessing what are the things you have to think about. So, the, so there's personal safety. People sometimes don't realize that going to a developing country, you better watch out for traffic accidents, to wear a seatbelt. Your taxi driver uh, may not have exactly um, the, your safety in mind as he darts in and out of traffic. Right. Um, uh, you have to know uh, that there's some basic aspects of food handling. You can't really trust food that's given to you, what, uh, just any sort of food. You shouldn't eat at street vendors. Uh, you shouldn't um, eat any food that's not piping hot as it comes to your table. You shouldn't eat fruits and vegetables that you haven't washed and peeled yourself. So you can peel your own fruits and vegetables. If you're going to wash the vegetables, you're supposed to really get some bottled water that's not going to be counterfeit bottled yeah. water. <laughs> that comes and, with the top off already on it as yeah. they bring it to the table. And with a fresh label that you wash the fruit and you, um, uh, and that's what you're supposed to do. Even that being said, uh, when we go to another country, even into Europe, or somebody from another country comes to the United States, some sort of diarrhea is inevitable. We call that traveler's diarrhea. And so the first topic that usually comes up is what's traveler's diarrhea? And traveler's diarrhea is, can range anything from a little bit of loosening of the stools, which is a little uncomfortable, to some crampy abdominal pain, even a fever to 101, 102 degrees. Can you prevent that? Um, it's difficult to prevent it if um, one wants to take Pepto-Bismol, um, a tablet every uh, uh, three or four hours, that's very useful. Um, it's hard to prevent because the traveler's diarrhea is most commonly associated with the change of, of the normal E. coli that's in your bowel flora, and that changes within a few days of moving to a new place. And so whether a foreign, somebody from another country comes here, we have different E. coli than if we go somewhere then, else. Yeah. Um, if it become, because travel is, um, is generally of short duration and every hour and every day is important and you don't have time to sit around in a hotel room feeling kind of crummy. Yucky, right. Um, we will generally recommend taking um, uh, preemptive treatment antibiotics with you. And depending on where people go, the, the, the antibiotic recommendation may be different. So the difference between traveler's diarrhea and then something more severe such as dysentery is also important. Traveler's diarrhea is, wa is kind of watery diarrhea. You're maybe feeling sick but not horribly sick. You're not in shock, you're awake, you're alert. But uh, dysentery is bloody diarrhea. And that's a uh, big it's, difference. It was a big difference. And if there's ever bloody diarrhea, you got to see a doctor. Got it. Um, so w when people are talking to you and getting prepared for all this, you're giving them this information that you, you can't really find as easily or as personalized on the internet. We also do know there are some countries you need to get immunizations to go for. Yes. Now, d does that. Is that something that goes through a travel medicine specialist, or do you, can you go to Costco and get it? So then the so so we talked about personal safety. We talked about diarrhea. We talked about how to try to avoid diarrhea, and traveler's diarrhea, and then uh, a dysentery, and how the best way of prevention is by trying to be safe with your eating habits, drinking habits. One of the things about drinking habits is is you shouldn't use ice in your drinks. Um, you, you'll often be asked whether or not you want ice in general, you should say no. Then the next category of preventable illness is a vaccine preventable illness. And this depends on where people are going and what they're going to be doing and for how long they're going to be doing it. Naturally. And so, uh, for example, there's no traveler's diarrhea vaccine that we use. There, it was thought that there was a cholera vaccine that we could use, but it turns out it doesn't work for the other bacteria, and we don't have So what have can people get then, you know, and, and to help them? Right. So, and, and how do they get it? 
And so the um, so the required there's only one internationally required vaccine now, and that's called the yellow fever vaccine. It's uh, the yellow fever vaccine is required for going uh, to primarily West Africa and to the Amazon basin of South America. And those are the places where yellow fever is, are, are endemic, where the disease is transmitted. So the recommendation, that's easy to find. It's on the CDC website of the Yellow Book. Um, or you can look under various travel advice uh, uh, sources. That's, that's all available easily through the internet. Okay. But you re it, it, what's required is a yellow card that's stamped by a certified yellow fever provider. Um, and there's certain uh, contraindications, so people who have compromised immune systems can't get the yellow fever vaccine. And so they have to have a signature by a medical professional that says medically contraindicated. You don't need, you can't get the vaccine. Gotcha. And you have to have that on a yellow card because when you present your passport at a foreign country where the yellow fever vaccination is required for entry, they may require, uh, in addition to your passport, that yellow card. Uh, on the yellow card, you'll also have all your other vaccinations, which is then the, the other reasons to be getting, uh, to be seeing a travel medicine specialist. In order to get the yellow fever vaccine, the, the, any yellow fever vaccine clinic has to be registered with the state of California, at least. With, so each state has to register its, its yellow fever vaccine clinics, and that's because the cold chain has to be maintained. So it's a legally required, you must go to a, a certified yellow fever clinic where they have a yellow card and a stamp that's been provided by the state of California. Understood. And for the other vaccinations uh, and the, uh, that are there that they need, they can get that through you. That's correct. And that there are other places that can provide that, but the, those places can't really provide the same advice that you can at a travel medicine, medicine center. So for people who are um, healthy and, um, and, and just, and they think they know what's going on and don't really have much to worry about, and you say, I need this, 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 this vaccine, you can go to Walgreens or CVS and they'll give you a vaccine, but they won't give you, give you the advice. Right, if somebody needs more, you're there if they need it. That's right. Okay. And that's important because um, many people are traveling these days. Um, some people have bucket lists. They may be ill. They may have, they may be near the end of their lives. They may have chronic illnesses. They may be very elderly. Um, they, there may be young families with small children going for longer periods of time. Um, anytime there's not just somebody who's say between the age of 20 and 50, uh, with no medical problems. They need more advice. They need more advice and needs to be specialized advice. Well, and then there's another group of people that we have concern about, and those are the people who are coming home after they've been traveling, and they don't feel good, and something's not quite right. And those people now have been in an environment that's different than the doctors here are used to. Uh, and and they, they come home, and they're sick, and nobody knows what to do. They go to their internal medicine doctor, perhaps, their family med doctor, and it's not quite right. Mm -hmm. Is that a service that a travel medical specialist is going to be dealing with? Absolutely. So we call this post-travel care. Uh, the good thing is that post-travel care is covered by insurance. Uh, often, unfortunately, pre-travel for personal enjoyment reasons is not often covered by insurance. Sure. So when people come back and they're sick, there's usually a couple of things that are most commonly associated with with seeking medical specialized care after travel. Uh, fever, anybody that's gone to Africa or Asia and comes back with an acute fever, a fever above 101 degrees and feeling bad, ought to see a tropical medicine or travel medicine specialist. And if because, they go to their regular doctor, they need to tell them they were just traveling. That's right. But it's, more important, it's even more important than that, because if there's any risk of malaria, uh, which is actually the number one killer of travel, it doesn't happen often, but we see thousands of cases of malaria that come into this country every year. And um, You know, that, that raises an issue that I'm thinking about is that, uh, you know, I went to med school. I never saw a case of malaria in my entire career. And, and as an ophthalmologist, I certainly don't now. Uh, there are doctors that aren't going to be equipped or should be expected to identify this, but there are also labs that aren't going to know how to evaluate any of the blood tests or the uh, stool samples or the other things that you send to them. I know you guys have a very special lab that's also run by someone who has got uh, a background that you can't find anywhere else. So we were lucky enough to have a chance to go take a look at the lab. I want to show everybody what's going on over there and then we'll talk about it. Okay, great.
Hello, I'm Sharon Reed. I'm a professor of pathology and medicine, and I'm director of the microbiology lab here at UCSD. We're here at the Center for Advanced Laboratory Medicine, known as COM at UCSD. On staff here, we have uh, 40 different people with a variety of different job descriptions. So we handle all the microbiology, cultures, diagnostics for the entire UCSD Health Sciences Center, as well as referral work we get from within the county and sometimes even from out of state. We get about 500 specimens a day, so we get a huge number of samples, but it's every variety, some for culture, some for serology. We have all aspects of diagnostic microbiology here. We have regular cultures, anaerobic cultures, fungal cultures, virology, you know, uh, tuberculosis cultures, all levels of serology, blood testing, and in addition, we have the biggest molecular laboratory, so for very rapid testing for a number of infections. We feel it's very different than many hospitals who may have a very limited test menu that they're able to do, and a lot of the work gets sent to bigger, to bigger laboratories. We try and do the majority of our work right here. So not only is it faster turnaround time, but we're much more experienced at seeing a wide variety of infections, such as tropical infections. So for instance, when a traveler comes back, it can be an exotic disease, or they could have acquired a fairly common disease in another country. And we really want to sort those out as rapidly as possible so they get the appropriate treatment and get well. We have a high definition cameras and scopes that will go right down to the receiving end at both Hillcrest and uh, Thornton Hospital. And so, for instance, we could show them a smear like this that would be a patient with vivax malaria. So we use tests that are 100 years old. We use tests that have just come out in the past year. So we're always upgrading, evaluating new tests. Um, to make sure we have just what's the best and the fastest and the most accurate for our patients. I know you've got all the machines there, you've got all the tests there, but as you told me before, it's the brain power that makes a difference in a lab like this that you guys can look for something that no one else even knows what to look for. So what is the difference in having a lab that's on site run by a travel medicine specialist or a specialist in tropical medicine than you can find anywhere else? Well, ruling out malaria is often a number one priority because malaria can kill people quickly. It can lead to very serious consequences. It's every bit of a medical emergency Understood. as a heart attack. Yes. And it can kill people just as fast. And so in infectious diseases and in, in this post-travel uh, medicine, we take it that seriously. So we will have a specialist looking at those slides within the hour. Uh, no matter what time of the day or night, and that's, we are prepared to do that because we understand that malaria is that much of a medical emergency. And you guys aren't going, well, what's that? Uh, I don't know. I haven't seen that before. I mean, you're, you're all over it. We have a half dozen uh, fully trained tropical medicine specialists on our staff, let alone uh, just general infectious disease and laboratory uh, specialists. So we, we know how to make a diagnosis and we know how to start the right treatments right away. If it's not malaria, then there's other things that have to be considered. And, uh, and that's, again, part of the expertise that we have. We know where, when people go places, we know what people get, where they go. And when people come back, we separate the diagnosis into, well, what if they didn't travel? And what if they did travel? And so maybe it's just something that's run-of-the-mill, normal stuff. Well, we can deal with that, no problem. The difficult part is knowing all the so-called weird stuff. A lot of doctors think of what we do as the weird stuff. Yeah, no, I feel like I'm talking to House, you know, yeah. from the television show, yeah. because you're de dealing with the stuff that nobody else figures out. Well, for us, it's fairly routine, actually. Because <laughs> you do it all the time. We do it all the time. Right, so we said fever post-travel. What else post-travel triggers a visit to you? So um, the two other most important reasons are gastrointestinal complaints, feeling uh, stomach ache, diarrhea, constipation, uh, bad smells, emanate, belching, uh, just feeling bad in, 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 the, in the belly. Um, so that's a very common reason. And we often will team up with our gastroenterology colleagues as well as uh, uh, the laboratory to look at the stools and if necessary to do the proper endoscopies with the proper evaluations. And that's part of our teamwork. 
Okay. The other major issue that can happen abroad is uh, our skin diseases, skin problems, which can have a broad range of complaints uh, that can ha happen for reasons not related to travel or directly related to travel. And some of these are fairly obscure uh, in, the general, in the general community, but we, we, we know how to recognize them uh, quickly, and sometimes they require uh, urgent intervention. Terrific. Now, in the last couple of minutes that we have left, I wanted to ask you what your thoughts are about how you would like to see this kind of organized, because I'm here on faculty with you at UCSD. Until we booked the show and got you on, I didn't know you existed. And so the, the, there's got to be a lot of people like me out there that don't know that you exist and that travel medicine services are available here at such an incredibly high level that, that people have access to you. So how should this be accessed? Who, I mean, should people be getting to you directly? Should they go through their regular doctor? How would you see this working if it worked according to you? So for somebody who has a, a real emergency, they need to come to the emergency room. For, for most, most cases are not like that. Most people should try to seek the primary care physician who then would refer to our, our infectious disease clinic, and that's post-travel. For pre-travel, we don't require any screening or any referral, and that should be easy to find by simply typing in Google UCSD travel clinic, right, and that so will bring us up. And those are the people traveling for a, a, a little longer time to a little bit more exotic places who may have chronic problems or uh, be not quite as healthy as the 20 to 50 year old, or they're bringing their kids with them. Those are the kind of people that sitting down with you, having you look them over and talk to them would be of huge value. It would, it's a very high value. I think it saves lives. Yeah, I, I'm listening to you talk off the top of your head about things that are just stuff that I haven't even heard about or talked about in, in ages. And to you, it's bam, bam, bam. You're the guy I want on my team and, and to, to coaching me as I get, get out there and if I come back, if there's a problem. Well, thank you. We're, we, you know, I'm one member of a, of a, of a team of physicians that, that we're, we're both interested and eager to, to see people and, and help them prevent illnesses. And if something happens, we want to take care of it. Well, thank you for taking the time to spend with us talking and for what you're doing every day in, in your offices here at UC San Diego. It's my pleasure. Um, you know, here it is again. If you're getting ready to do something which seems as simple as traveling, it's pretty complicated to make sure that you do this right. So you want to make sure that you at least take the few steps of going online and check where you're going. And if you have any medical problems, you definitely want to seek out a travel medicine specialist to make sure that you're prepared to prevent the problem. The old saying that prevention is worth, uh, the ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure still holds. But if you come back and you have a problem, some of those can be very serious, and many doctors are not equipped and prepared to really answer the question of what's wrong. And you can get a long delay before your diagnosis is made. You need to be at a place that has the capability, the expertise, the brain power, and the backup with the, in the form of a lab that can work with you to be able to get the answers that you need. There aren't many out there, and I'm glad we had a chance to tell you about one today. Knowledge is power. I'm Dr. David Granite, and we look forward to seeing you again next time right here on Health Matters. Thank you.